Good morning, children of God. May the peace of Christ be upon you. May the power of the Holy Spirit surround you as we share his word together this morning. I am Pastor Todd. We are here at Saudi United Methodist Church, and we are delighted to welcome you to this video message. If you have an opportunity, if you are in our area, uh, our worship service here in the sanctuary begins at 10 a.m. each Sunday morning. It is a traditional service, uh, and we invite you to come and to visit and take part. We would love to have you and to welcome you. We are nearing the conclusion of our sermon series entitled Problematic Passages 2, in which we've been exploring some scripture verses that prove challenging, confusing, or which just raise a lot of questions that we struggle to understand. As we've made our way through this series, we have come across some tools that we can use to help us interpret problematic passages. We've said that we should always allow scripture to interpret scripture. That is, discover if key words or phrases appear elsewhere in scripture and see if those instances are clearer or easier to understand. We should make use of biblical resources such as commentaries, study aids, Bible dictionaries, the internet with caution, drawing upon the hard work and the research of others. We should always determine what's at stake in our problematic passage. Is it something that is critical to our faith, to what we believe and how we live? Or is it something that doesn't carry quite as much weight and emphasis? We should consider all of the evidence that surrounds the problematic passage that we are struggling with. What is the historical, the social, the cultural, the political, the religious backgrounds. Dig around and find some of that information and see how it applies to the problematic passage. And then lastly, we've said that whenever we approach the scripture, we should always do so with a, a sense of humility, uh, a sense of reverence. We should come before the scriptures seeking the teaching and the guiding and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit and maintaining uh, a teachable spirit within us. So far in our sequel sermon series, we've looked at some passages in Genesis about what it means to be made in the image of God and what privileges and responsibilities come with such a high honor. We have looked at the issue of violence in the Old Testament. And last Sunday, we explored a very strange story about an old, bald man. No, it was not me. Uh, some corrupt young people, bears, and holiness. And if you are concerned about that, if you have questions about that, or wondering just what I'm talking about, check out last Sunday's video. This morning, we are going to turn our attention to a passage that has always confounded me. If you have your Bibles, let's go to Matthew 27, verses 50 to 53. Matthew 27, verses 50 to 53. Now, contextually, this passage occurs at the time of the death of Jesus. Matthew is the only gospel writer to mention it. A peculiar event occurred when Jesus died that I cannot remember ever hearing a sermon about or really any explanation for. A, a cursory reading would seem to suggest that there were zombies in Jerusalem after Jesus died. Matthew chapter 27 beginning in verse 50. Then Jesus shouted out again and he released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart, and tombs opened. 
The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city of Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So just what is going on in this passage? Is there a way to make some kind of sense out of this? Well, there is, but much of what we have to fall back on is speculation and conjecture because there simply isn't enough biblical material to draw hard and fast conclusions. When Jesus died, it says, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, theologically, that means that God was initiating a new way for people to approach him, for people to be in his presence. Only the high priest ever saw behind that temple curtain, and then only one time a year. But when Jesus died, God sent a message that the old way of doing things was over. Now there would be a new way to know God. That would be through the Messiah, Jesus. The ripping of the temple curtain was a symbol declaring that anyone could approach God, not just the high priest. Then we are told the earth shook, rocks split apart, and tombs opened. Now, it wouldn't be unusual for tombs to break open during an earthquake. The majority of tombs in biblical times were either caves that were sealed over with stones or a grave with piles of stones on top of it to keep the animals from getting at the body. So an earthquake could very easily cause rocks to to shift, to roll, and even to split apart. But there's also a symbolic significance to these events. They are apocalyptic in nature. That is, they are symbols that the Old Testament consistently used to refer to the coming of God's kingdom or to refer to God's anger or to refer to God's presence or his judgment. Earthquakes, thunder and lightning, fire, rock splitting apart, and similar phenomenon are what theologians call theophanic symbols. What a great phrase. I'm sure you can find a way to use that in a conversation sometime this week. Theophanic symbols. When we see those things in Scripture, we know that the author is talking about and is pointing to the powerful, holy presence of God. So Matthew's use of those things here tells us that everything that's happening in this passage is all about God. It's his doing. It's his presence. He is the source of all these events. Jesus was dead, so he wasn't the one doing it. It was the power of God alone. Now, of course, the death of Jesus was not the death of just any normal human being. When normal people die, there aren't earthquakes and rocks breaking apart. Matthew wants us to understand that Jesus was more than just a regular human being. He was fully human, but he was more than that. Matthew makes this even plainer when we look in chapter 27, verse 54. It says, The Roman officer and the other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that had happened. They said, This man truly was the Son of God. But what are we to make of the verses that follow? 
the bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city of Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. Now, as I said a moment ago, there's a lot of speculation, but not a lot of hard evidence as to what this means. Who were these godly men and women? Some translations uh, refer to them as saints. If they appeared to many people in Jerusalem, then why don't we hear about it anywhere else? Were these bodies like Lazarus, just a, a flesh and blood body that had been brought back to life by the power of God? Or were they glorified bodies like Jesus would have and has in heaven? There are a lot of questions and unfortunately no satisfactory answers. Matthew did not feel it important to include a lot of details. So this is one of those instances where we need to consider what is at stake in this passage. Is this passage crucial to our salvation or how we live as Christians? Not really. Matthew was not trying to give us a detailed play-by-play -play account of everything that happened when Jesus died. He emphasized those symbols that pointed to the power and the presence of God at work. His intent was to show his readers that when Jesus died, it set in motion a, change, a chain of events that would forever change history. This problematic passage isn't really crucial to our faith and our life because it's really just a series of symbolic events about what God was doing. Therefore, we don't need to have all of the answers. We don't need to put a nice, neat little bow on top of this passage and declare it is solved. Personally, I would really like to do that because I still have questions about this passage and who these godly men and women were that came back to life and were seen in Jerusalem. But we don't have that information. So we just have to step back and realize that from the tearing of the curtain in the temple to the dead rising from their graves and leaving their tombs, God was declaring that the death of Jesus Christ removed the curse of sin. The blood atonement that Jesus offered through his body on the cross was accepted by God. It was received and God said it is sufficient. It signified that the old system of animal sacrifices was over. The death of Jesus cleansed us of our sins and satisfied God's righteous requirements according to his law. All of these events in this problematic passage, the tearing of the curtain, the rocks breaking apart, the earthquake, the dead leaving their tombs and walking around in Jerusalem. These things are kind of like special effects in a movie. The special effects in a movie are not the story. They are ways of enhancing and telling the story. When special effects in a movie become more important than the plot, the movie inevitably fails. And you've probably seen a film or two like this where the special effects were just amazing, um, but there really wasn't much else to the film except the special effects. In the same way, Matthew uses darkness and earthquake, broken rocks, open tombs, and resurrected bodies like special effects. They are not the story. They are ways of enhancing and telling the story. The real story in these verses 
is that God is the author of salvation. And through Jesus Christ, he has made a way for all people, not just the high priest, not just the super religious, not just the wealthy, everybody to be able to come to him. So no, there were no zombies in Jerusalem after the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrected bodies were either people like Lazarus, whom God had just brought back to natural life. Maybe they were the patriarchs, the prophets, the martyrs of old. Or maybe they were glorified heavenly bodies like Jesus has in heaven right now that appeared to people in Jerusalem before they went on to paradise. How long they remained, what they may have done or said, is unknown. But in the grand scheme of things, it really doesn't matter. What Matthew wants us to understand is that the death of Jesus inaugurated a new way for people to come into God's presence. Not through a temple, not through a high priest, not through an animal sacrifice, but through Jesus Christ. Would you bow with me and let us pray? Heavenly Father, you gave your only begotten Son as the ultimate perfect sacrifice for our sins. Because of that, We can come to you without an intermediary. You have welcomed us into your holy presence because of the blood of Christ. We thank you for this passage in Matthew that reminds us of that fact and that reminds us of where our salvation and our lives come from. You are the supreme source of everything, the prime mover of all creation, And we rejoice to be known as your children. Let the same power that shook the earth, broke rocks, and raised the dead to life fill us and work through us this week. We pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Thank you once again for joining me here. We are uh, a little shorter than uh, the, the past couple of messages, so... Hey, you get out of church a little early today. Amen. Thank you for joining me here. I pray you have a blessed and a wonderful day. Next Sunday, we will wrap up this sermon series on problematic passages too by looking at a really sticky issue, topic. Um, What is the relationship between Christians and the government? Should be interesting. I found a whole lot of material, most of which I was not able to fit into the sermon. Uh, So hope you will come back, uh, check out the video next week uh, as we wrap up this series. Thank you once again. Have a blessed and wonderful day from Saudi United Methodist Church.